I'm Yoav. Uh, I'm a father of two, a uh, husband. I've been a software engineer for over a decade now. Um, yeah, I'm part of the Quick team, and I also podcast, uh, um, write, speak sometimes, you know, when I can remember how to talk. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm uh, currently cooking up something new. I'm in between kind of things, but uh, follow me to, to see what I do next. And like Yanni mentioned, my talk is uh, titled, How Quick's Compiler Enables JavaScript Streaming and Automatic Optimization. I know, a mouthful, but wait for it. So how did I get here at all, right? Um, <clears throat> if some of you may have visited the website before, uh, Mishko Hevery, uh, the creator of Quick and uh, Angular and Karma and some more stuff, uh, was supposed to speak, uh, but he couldn't make it, and then he tapped me in, basically, and then like, okay, prepare a talk in <laughs> a little time. But uh, hopefully I'll uh, fill his big shoes well enough. But let's circle back a minute. So how did I get to be like part of the quick team and how, how, how I got here to Helsinki? Uh, it was, a, by the way, a difficult ride. I lost my luggage, but let's put it aside. Anyways, I was a building, I used to work at Fiverr for a while. So I built a new product at Fiverr. Uh, while building that new product, I had a chance to kind of uh, um, use Builder.io product. Um, and that is where I learned about Quick, right? I heard that there's this new framework by Mishko, the guy that, that Angular, like I mentioned. Now, what I heard about it at that point is this is a new framework that is going to basically give you performance out of the box. Now, later on, I heard that uh, Shai Resnick, um, who's also part of the Quick team now, uh, was organizing a workshop for like 10 people where, back in Tel Aviv, where I live. Now, it was supposed to have the best developers like around town, and I said I had to go. So, two years ago, I had the privilege to attend this workshop, and I got to meet Mishko in person. Very nice dude. And the whole reason I went to that workshop is the pain I felt of working on, up, on optimizing websites. Like, in my past, I dealt with <clears throat> performance issues on a big content site. I used to work for a travel startup that was doing mostly content-heavy websites. Now, let me tell you, it wasn't easy, right? It always starts with this, right? Someone up top comes to you and says, our website is slow. So if you could uh, fix that, that would be great, right? You've got a ton of things to worry about, right? Now, I went on X and asked, like, what are the things you need to worry about when you're working on performance? And Dan Shapir answered me. Dan Shapir, if you don't know, is a co-host of uh, JS Jabber, a uh, web performance expert. Uh, he used to do web performance at Wix. So he said these things. You got to always profile before you optimize. Right? Your intuition is never really like where, where it's really at. Uh, you got to also profile after optimizing. Just because you improve your test environment doesn't mean you improve everywhere. Right? Verify in production monitor performance, <coughs> set performance budgets, choose tools that will help you fall into the pit of success. And of course, you also got to educate your team, right? And it's always good when you work with people like this. Okay, this is not landing, yeah, Finnish people, come on, a little bit of laugh. <laughs> um, another good friend of mine, Gal Schlesinger, works at Vercel as a platform engineer, he used to work at Wix. And he, he put out this uh, funny tweet. The amount of improved pref commit we reverted at Wix thanks to tooling was too damn high. It was almost as if improved performance is a hint that this commit degrades performance. So like I said, there's a ton to worry about, right? It's a tough problem. You got to measure stuff. You have to worry about JavaScript, bundle size, lazy loading. Do you do it? What kind of rendering do you do, right? You load time performance. Other performance, why am I getting messages right now? Sorry. 
Do you use an SPA? Do you do load time? All those stuff. Too many things to worry about. You need to worry about images, CSS. But let me tell you, if you're having performance problems, let me tell you, son. I got 99 problems, but CSS never is one. Now, knowing what to optimize for is mostly known. Right? Like, the actual biggest bang for your buck is going to come from optimizing JavaScript, right? That is where the most improvements can be made. But that is hard. Again, you got to deal with monstrosities like Webpack boundary line and other. You got to deal with your node models, right? Which is the heaviest object in the universe. It's like playing web performance whack a mole. Every single thing you fix, then somebody else can break really easily. And of course, when you work on break performance, you might become this dude. So once again, choose tools that will help you fall into the pit of success. <clears throat> now, from the beginning, web tools, what they tried to do, right, is solve perf issues and developer experience. Now, just before we, we get to the meat of this talk, we need to understand what has come before. So let's look at like the different web, web framework generations. So Gen 0, the first thing, static files, Gen 1, MPA, SSR, Gen 1.5, MPA, and JS. So this is like WordPress sprinkled with jQuery and stuff. Then we have the Generation 2, which is single page applications, React, Vue, Angular, and the rest. And the current framework generation is 2.5, where you have SSR with an SPA, and these are hydration-based frameworks. <coughs> now, so like we said, static, we have a client, we have a server, we just call the server, right? We get back a static file, static HTML, pretty simple. With an MPA with SSR, we have some data that gets passed by your user, server runs, then it returns a dynamic HTML page. With generation 1.5, you get the data, and the HTML, the actual user, if a user clicks, then there's some JavaScript that runs, right? With an SPA, you get the client calling the server, right, but you get an empty document uh, with a div, basically, and then you have to run JavaScript to get your data from the server again. You get back JSON, and then you get your HTML. Now, with hydration based, you call the server, right? You get HTML with JSON, but then you need to download the JS once again. You need to parse it. Then you got to execute it once again. And then you need to bind all the event listeners again. So you're doing the same work actually twice. Only then can a user interact with it, right? Now, let's circle back a minute to the workshop, right? So I attended the workshop. And when I went in, I was very skeptical about this new framework, right? Like, really, another framework? And then Mishko started explaining things, and of course, he was looking like crazy. It was sounded complicated the way you explained it. So I had to process. Now, what, what, what happened in the workshop? Like I said, all the people there were like, people that I look up to, developers that I really looked up to and understand a thing or two. We ha I had people from uh, Node.js that are core contributors to Node.js and working on uh, old libraries like Bluebird, for example. Now, all of these people, when they came out, they, they thought what we saw was something new, something exciting, something different. It's not like something we already knew before that. So what is quick in a nutshell, right? Tagline is it allows you to build fully interactive JavaScript apps at any scale that load instantly with no extra effort. After I read this, and after I attended the conference, and after I thought about it, it hit me. Automatic optimization, right? This is, this is the thing here. There's a tool that I can use to write code and not do all the manual stuff that I'm used to. 
And I felt like this is the future. I got to get into this. And so I went in on a deep dive and wrote a blog post back in September 22. And that is kind of something that helped me go and join Builder. In November 2022, I joined Builder. It was a series of events that led there. If you want to know a little bit more, you can ask me later. And then I had the opportunity to work with the quick team and get to know the people and the technology a little bit closer, right? And dive deeper. So that is the reason why I could pull back the curtain a little bit and unveil what's behind it to explain it to you, right? Uh, so remember the title of the talk, like I said, it was a little mouthful. Um, I don't know if you've read like what Mishko's title was, but it was something in the terms of uh, serialization, the secret of O1 frameworks. Who, who titled it better? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so what I realized that Quicks is trying to do is optimize automatically, right? And it does this by something we like to call JavaScript streaming. What the heck is JavaScript streaming, right? The best way we, we found to explain this among the team is it's like video streaming for your JavaScript, okay? Not to be confused with uh, HTML streaming or out of order streaming, right? We're talking about sending functions and closures over the wire. And a little while ago, uh, my buddy, Shai Riznik, uh, just gave a talk in uh, JS WorldConf titled JavaScript Streaming, A Quick Glimpse into the Future. And he shared his theory behind JavaScript Streaming and why wouldn't you trust this guy? Wouldn't you trust a wizard? Look at him. Doesn't he look really trustworthy? <laughs> so, in the past, right, you wanted to watch a movie. You had to download the whole file. But if you wanted to watch the last 10 minutes, you had to wait to download the whole file, then go and scroll through and watch the last 10 minutes. But nowadays, we don't do this anymore, right? What do we do? People? What do we watch? Streaming, right. So Netflix, YouTube, on, and all the rest. But the thing is, like, if you, if you are um, uploading a video to YouTube, you don't upload it like bit by bit, chunk by chunk. You don't bring it up manually and, and slow pieces. It happens automatically, right? Let's talk about the stages of JavaScript string. We have chunking into segments, and we have then the smart first frame. We have segment buffering and lazy execution. Let's dive it one by one, right? Segment chunking is taking one JavaScript file and breaking it up into multiple chunks, right? Segments, we like to call them. We're really good at bundling things together, right, in the JavaScript ecosystem. But something that is hard is breaking things apart, right? And Quick's compiler is one of the things you do. We'll get to that a little bit later. Now, many of the chunks we don't really need for the client, right? They might not be used. So during the build time, these chunks get named. This is also a part that's on the beta compiler. And then there's some work being done on the server. We pause it, we take the HTML, and we send a really smart frame of HTML. Now, the smart frame or smart HTML has all the information we need about the app state. Second part, client buffering. This happens inside a service worker in the background, right? We just load what we need. And then we have third step, lazy execution, right? So we already have all the files in the cache. So as soon as a user clicks on something, it comes in right from the cache. And it's all interactive right on the spot. And if he goes into another one, right, again, another piece of JavaScript goes and works. Now remember pause and resume. Who here has heard of resumability? All right, not many. So resumability is powered by JavaScript streaming. Lazy execution is the ability to resume from where the server left off. Triggering an event handler is like pressing the play button on your remote. Notice something. There was no hydration. 
You can start an app basically from any listener when you use Quick. It's interactive right from the start. Right? The entry points are the segments, are the listeners. So let's take a look at the two pieces that are actually done by the compiler. Right? Now, the optimizer, Quick Compiler, is based on Rust and uses SWC and then Vt and Rollup. How does it work? The optimizer goes and looks for dollars inside the code base. Right? That's our marker. That is a marker for the compiler and the developer to know that there's some magic happening here, right? Something special is going to happen. And this, like I mentioned, happens in the build step through Vt and Rollup. What it does is makes everything serializable and async. It extracts everything into a module. And like I mentioned, only load what you need and execute when you need it. That's what makes it possible. If we do it this way, it's a big win for everyone. But how would you make a function lazy loadable? Have you ever thought about it? What do you need to do to make something lazy loadable? Let's have a look at a simple example, right? We have this very simple function. There's a little iffy in it, if anybody remembers what an iffy is. And we have uh, a constant there. We have the function that closes over the scope of x. And if we want to make it lazy loadable, this is what we have to do. Also, you can imagine this being a hook or a use effect or something like that, right? What do we have to do? We have to name it and call it, right? Extract the init function. Then we need to move it out of the top function, right? But then we're missing the variable, right? Where's x? Then we need to pass in a parameter, right? And at this point, we, we pass the parameter, like I mentioned. We got to move it into a different file. And then we need to lazily import it. So there's a lot of manual steps, right? That's just to extract a function. The complexity that you have to deal with is pretty staggering, no? That is the pain I was talking about. This is the kind of stuff you need to deal with. You need to do a lot of manual steps to do stuff to improve performance, right? Just think about what, what it would take to extract a closure. Now, we've discussed how the optimizer does it. And simply, it's just, he breaks it apart, right? Extracts it into a module. Gives it a name. Serializes it into the HTML. And it creates a map so it can know later on the client how to lazy execute and find the things that it needs. Mishko tweeted this out a long time ago, right? We know how to serialize JSON, right? We need data, which is JSON. That is the output of it. And a code is just a file. But how do you serialize a closure, right? That is one of the key innovations to Quick, which allows resumability in JavaScript streaming. Quick does the same thing for closures. It knows where to load the scope, right? So in Quick, this is all you have to do. Like, forget about the JSX down here. But in the end, we didn't have to move files and do all the stuff. We have the dollar marker that helps us do that. All right, let's do a quick demo. Now I'm connected to the Wi-Fi, and let's have a look at something. Oh, my bad. No, no, stop. OK. extend. Uh, where did it go? No. I want to mirror it. Sorry. Mirror. There we go. All right, 
So this is the quick playground. And I've prepared a little bit just to uh, avoid all this confusion, right? So I'm just going to copy paste some quick code into here. So uh, can you see the code? Do I need to make it bigger? We good? All right. So simple function. This is what I showed before. Now what I want to show you is how this whole thing kind of maps out, right? So we have the simple x, right? And we have the function of greet that has a console log that uses the variable x and a string. And the way it breaks it apart, right? Let's look at the HTML for a minute. So the HTML, like I said, it has all the information it needs. So it's in a posit uh, posit state, right? Um, it shows the base, and it has a marker for where what the on click is, right? There is this hash that tells it where this little thing is. And if we take this hash, right? And then look at the client bundles. Now this is the playground. It shows how Quicks works behind the scenes. And if we take this and look for our marker, right? We see it's in a different file. Build app component hash, right? And then we have one more file that actually only has the function itself. If we look for this app, there's the console log. It did all that work for us. Now, I'll show you how it extracts scope. If we have a little piece of reactive state, okay, so a signal, right? Signal, um, does anybody not know what a signal is? No, everybody knows what a signal is, great. So um, a signal, right, reactive piece of state where you can mutate and then re-renders uh, your DOM. Um, so we have a signal here and we pass it in to RP and we increment it by mutating it. Right, so we have the scope, and then if we look at the information that we have inside the HTML, again, we have a hash that leads to the actual file that has the onclick event handler. Then we have some data within, like a JSON, that has this weird kind of syntax that tells us about the scope and where it is. And if we look at the client bundle once more, and this is something we need to fix, we have to scroll, we use this thing called use lexical scope. It basically takes the closure and hoists it up so it can be used by other components or files or anything it needs. All right. Let me put this back. And lovely. Back with the mouse. <clears throat> so I know what, what you might be thinking. Okay. If you load everything from small segments, wouldn't that make it slow? So, not necessarily. We can decide which chunk segments go together, right? And someone be needed, like I mentioned. So, we break it apart to, to kind of groups, okay? And we can also optimize and know what the interactions are that a user does. And we have this within Quick with Quick Insights, all right? Quick Insights is uh, something that Mishko built like a while back ago that basically helps you correlate between user interactions in which bundles or chunks a user needs to complete an interaction on a page. So this is statically analyzed and can and optimized by AI. Now, obviously, um, the information gathered is, is anonymous completely. We can know which order the user needs those segments based on this analysis. So to recap, There's a lot of pain in manual optimization, right? A lot of stuff to do. Now, 
we went over the web frameworks generations and how JS string works, right? We talked about the op auto optimizer, the compiler of Quick, and a little bit about Quick Insights. What does the future hold, though? Now, I don't know, right? I am not Nostradamus. But after having some conversations uh, here um, just last night with some people from TC39, it seems that uh, signals, JavaScript streaming, and lazy execution might be a part of the tools in our ecosystem in the future. So that's really exciting to hear that what we're doing in Quick is kind of coming back together with things that are being worked on into language, right? So the philosophy of automatic optimization is for everyone, right? It's for all the web. And we see this with other tools and other frameworks they're doing. They got image components that help you optimize images. Now uh, React with its new compiler that helps you optimize your code without needing to do it manually again. These abstractions can help build great DX. What's next for Quick? So we're working on Quick 2.0 is coming very soon. We're working on out of order streaming and a bigger ecosystem. And now Quick is a com even more community driven. And now is in a new domain, quick.dev. You can go check it out. If you want, you can check out the QR code, have some links there, and thank you.